economic history after Marx. Adjusting Marx. History professors paid little attention to Marx's interpretation of history, and only a few scholars in other fields took up Marxist theory to expound on it or criticize it. Eugen Bohm Bawak engaged Marxist in an ardent controversy over the crucial contention that goods have had value to the degree labor has been used to produce them. He maintained the marginalist view that psychological mechanisms in the buyer determine value. This was given uh, a view that would prevail in Western e economics and was destined to discredit Marx's labor theory of value in economics, on which rested much of the Marxist claim that laborers were the only producers, as well as Marx's vision of capitalism's demise. Much of what Marx or Max Weber wrote also challenged Marx's social thought and historical views, m such as Weber's insistence on capitalism's origin and complex human relationships and ideas, including the ethical scheme of Protestantism, and above all on value-guided actions by individuals as the true shapers of events and history. On the other hand, however, a large group of laborers and their sympathizers among intellectuals considered the concepts of surplus value, class, class struggle, exploitation, and accumulation of capital to be the long-sought explanations of the laborers' problems in Western society. These groups transformed Marx's theory of social and society and history into an action program for socialist parties. While the multitude was content simply to be inspired by Marxism, some sympathetic yet more cautious intellectuals kept checking and rechecking the accuracy of Marxist theory out of scholarly habit and also to make it perform even better in the arena of political life. Soon a tension arose, however, one yet to be re relived and relieved between Marxism as an action program for mass movements and Marxism as a theory for scholars. The first called for a devout, unquestioning belief in Marxist tenets. Indeed, in his whole system of thought, including the unqualified promise of an end to the history of toil and struggle with the collapse of capitalism. <clears throat> the Marxist scholars, on the other hand, needed some critical distance between themselves and Marxist theory for testing the Marxist thesis. <clears throat> the first few sponsored an orthodox Marxism, the second, at least in a few Marxists, a more empirical Marxism. In the year 1899, Eduard Bernstein called for some empirical adjustment in the orthodox Marxist theory of history because capitalism had turned out to be more adaptive and imaginative than expected. In many industrial countries and economies, credit provisions, cartels, and trusts modified the business cycle. Trade unions helped blunt social conflict through social reforms, and parliamentary governments gave increasing influence to the proletariat. All of that tended to postpone the penultimate. Uh, penultimate conflict of classes and therefore to put in doubt the tenet of the Im imminent and, in and inevitable collapse of capitalism. Bernstein advocated dropping the Marxist concept of a sudden ap apocalyptic end to capitalism in favor of an evolution towards socialism by way of constant social reform. He confessed that to me that which is generally called the ultimate aim of socialism is nothing but the movement is nothing but the movement is everything. Hints of such gradualism also appeared in John Jara's work with its doubts about rigid economic determinism. Bernstein's idea brought angry rebuttals in the label of revisionist from the advocates of literal adherence to Marxist tenets. As for Marxist theory, Bernstein put in doubt what Engels had said. Just as Darwin discovered the law of development of organic nature, so Marx discovered the law of development of human history. Marxist Marxism became, instead of the ultimate statement on social development, the instrument for social reform. As for Marxist political practice, doubts about capitalism's collapse as an actual, inevitable, and imminent event eroded the hope of the masses for their emancipation. Confronted with problems and ambiguities, orthodox Marxists, rather than change Marx and Engels' system, engaged in extensive studies in order to clarify what Marx had really meant. Whenever they de deviated from Marx's words, it was seen as an interpretation, not as a change. Their central historical tenet remained the collapse of capitalism, that grand event which would end the long era of human prehistory and begin a true human history. Karl Kotsky essentially reaffirmed Marx's views. Rosa Luxemburg reiterated the need for resolution as an inspiration to the proletariat. Rudolf Hilferding stressed need for political action over reliance on an automatic collapse. The Austrian Marxist produced the sophistication studies, but in the end supported Kotsky and Georgi 
Plekhanov affirmed Marx's doctrine of a necessary historical development so faithfully that he even advocated the building of a capitalist industrial Russia before any changes towards socialism were introduced. Economic history and its problems, the impact of Marxism marked even the works of the non-Marxist new school of economic history in Germany, particularly those of its chief scholar, Gustav Schmoller. At the first side of the work of the new school, it resembled closely that of the old school with the same preferences for studying economic institutions and development rather than timeless market processes and for treating the more distant past rather than the recent one. But also evident were a greater sophistication in research and in uh, Schomer's uh, Schmoller's eventual suggestions on social policy grew out of his study of economic history in which he considered the state, not the market or the class, as the key entity. Economic and political part, party and policy must treat the human being not as a theoretical homo o economicus, an abstract isolated individual, or as a member of an economic class, but as a citizen of a nation. Accordingly, economic policy must be guided by insights gained from national history, not from theoretical models. Economic history demonstrated that questions of ethics and justice must figure in political economy, as Schmoller still called economics with the same prominence as markets and economic motives. In the case of Germany, however, her social and economic problems would only be solved by a national effort under the traditional leadership of the Hohenzollern dynasty, intending to help help implement that solution, Schmoller and a few others founded the Verein für Sozialpolitik in 1872, and despite being derided as Katheder Sozialisten, or mere academic socialists, persuaded Wilhelm von Bismarck to institute the earliest social programs of any industrial nation at the time, including health and pension insurance. That, however, was the last hour of prominence for the new school. In the 1880s, Schmoller became embroiled in a method in straight, an ardent discussion over the proper method for economic studies. Schmoller's historical approach collided with the pure theory of the neoclassicist Karl Menger. One, the one emphasized the historically concrete, the other the abstract, the one relied on price history, the other on price theory. The one spoke of actual past economic behavior and the other of typical economic behavior. The one stressed lessons gained from descriptive history, the other worked with theoretical models applicable everywhere and at any time. Again, Schmoller's historical approach was relied on price history as well as actual past economic behavior and also lessons gained from descriptive history. Like most discussions of methods, this method in straight was really a far-reaching dispute over the structure of reality, in this case of economic reality, but it did not bring about the divorce of economic theory from economic history. It only made visible a separation that had already developed. The gap widened when Menger's followers opened the doors of economics even wider to psychology and mathematics, as they emphasized microeconomics, the study of the economic behavior of firms, industries, and private households with its short-run perspective and its emphasis on price theory. Little remained of the analysis of long-range economic change or attempts to find historical economic types. Now economists prefer to theorize on the timeless and typical processes of the market and therefore moved ever closer to the ideals of the ahistorical natural sciences. The United States, once more a special case, late in the 19th century, America, in the process of being rapidly transformed from a rural into an urban industrialized society, also showed a heightened awareness of economic matters. It helped that in the 1880s, economic history became an acceptable endeavor in England. In that decade, William Cunningham, William J. Ashley, J. E. Thorold, Rogers, and Arnold Toynbee published important works on English economic history, and the subject began to be taught at academic institutions. Although direct German influence was tenuous, the English economic historians worked within a similar framework of ideas, including the interde interdependence between the economic and other aspects of human life, the state as an important instrument of economic and social reform, economic development seen as evolution, and the centrality of economic change <clears throat> or mutability. But no method in strike 
rocked English economic history, an empirical attitude characterized economic theoreticians and historians alike. Such cooperation also dominated the second meeting of the American Historical Association of 1885, at which the American Economic Association was founded. For some years, the two societies lived in a symbiotic relationship, and economic history enjoyed a modest boom at that time. In the early 1900s, however, Harvard called on J. Or W. J. Ashley to teach economic history there, and the Carnegie Foundation planned an economic history of the United States. Economic matters also interested the new historians of the early 20th century who wished to widen the scope of history beyond the political area. In the early 1900s, some American new historians who searched for what they considered the real forces shaping society focused their attention on the economic aspect of life. A few of them even acknowledged a debt to Marx's theory, but the grand philosophical scope of that theory fit poorly with American pragmatic activism. Edwin R. A. Uh, Seligman, an admirer of, of Marx, stated the moderate stance on Marxism well when he said that as a philosophical doctrine of universal validity, the theory of historical materialism can no long, longer be successfully defended. But in the narrower sense of the economic interpretation of history, in that narrow sense, namely the economic factor, has been the utmost importance in history, and that the historical factor must be reckoned with in economics. The theory has been, and still is, of considerable significance. <clears throat> and so, as we can see, economics plays a factor uh, in regard to the importance of importance in history. In the spirit of realism, Sligmans also conceded that it, which is Marx's theory, has taught us to search below the surface, that service where Seligman thought all political and diplomatic history remained. But in the United States, too, those who took up the cause of an economic interpretation of the past remained outside the mainstream of theoretical economics. Just as in Europe, in the United States, economic theory and history had separated. The original union of the American Historical Association and the American Economic Association had been dissolved when economists began to prefer to study and deal in timeless patterns rather than the maze of contingent phenomena of economic history. Thorstein uh, Veblen tried to stop this drifting apart. He attacked the picture of the economic world drawn by the neoclassicist econom economists, one of whom, J.B. Clark, had been his teacher. Veblen d denied that it was possible to understand the economy of a country by viewing it abstractly as a system of forces in equilibrium, one in which people were seen as always calculating rationally and one which was unaffected by complex social changes. The abstract model of the economic sphere was kept artificially simple by a deliberate isolation from the real-life situation. Through his own analysis, Veblen discovered such typical phenomena as the curtailment of producti productivity by the wasteful practices of a leisure class, artificial restraints introduced by established business itself, and irrational behavior by consumers, for example, their proclivity to ape others and to waste their money on cons conspicuous consumption. Most influential turned out to be Veblen's view on the overall development of the American economy. It was governed by the conflict between industry, producing real values being based on workmanship, and serving the interest of the common people or the masses and business, satisfying mere acquisitiveness, creating pecuniary values only, and conspiring to keep up the status quo. Veblen expected the conflict to end in the collapse of capitalism. But despite their eagerness for social reform, the new historians did not rush to study economic history. From Veblen's and Marx's works, they took primarily the concept of social conflict, fueled by economic motives. That concept, however, inspired a man by the name of Charles Beard. Again, it was the idea or concept of social conflict that is fueled by economic motives. Charles Beard, whose social activism was stimulated by his Quaker background, a, <clears throat> a visit to turn of the century Chicago, the social sciences, and an admiration for Fabian socialism. In 1913, Charles Beard applied the economic interpretation of the past to a well-known topic in American history an economic interpretation of the Constitution of the United States challenged the traditional view that the Constitution of the United States resulted from a wise blend of theory and expertise, a balance between affirmation and restraint of libertas, and a grasp of past and present wisdom, as if the whole people in their desire for liberty and order had created the Constitution. But Charles Beard had rejected all such talk about idealism, wisdom, and providence, be it that of God or of the progress of liberty itself. 
It was based on illusions that an industrial society must expunge before true democracy could be established. The economic interpretation of history alone offered the proper historical understanding for guiding the democratization of society. Its basic tenet taught us that different degrees and kinds of property inevitably exist in modern society. Party doctrines and principles originate in the sentiments and the views which, the, which are the possession of various kinds of property, and that creates in the minds of the possessors. Class and group divisions based on property lie at the basis of modern government, and politics and constitutional law are inevitably a reflex of these contending interests. The Constitution bore the marks of just such a conflict, which in American society was fought between a popular party based on paper money and an agrarian interests, and a conservative party centered in the towns and resulting on financial, mercantile, and personal property interests generally. The founding fathers represented specific property interests, those of the owners of liquid capital, who had no sympathy for the small landowners at all, and the prop propertyless mass. If political genius guided the drafting of the basic law of the Republic of the United States, it had at least an influential constant companion in economic interests. From that perspective, the Constitution was a conservative measure which tamed the spirit of the American Revolution, which Charles Beard perceived as a radical social upheaval. The suspicion that economic motives, the true dominant forces, were hidden behind lofty ideals, often deliberately, would be a prominent feature of progressive history and its successors. It also would make conflict the key explanatory concept in some variants of social history.